Thank you all for coming uh, for Urbana's AGM. Appreciate you taking the time and being here. Uh, we'll try to make it as helpful and as edifying as possible. The format <clears throat> we generally use at our AGM is we go through the formal part of things we have to approve and deal with. We then terminate the formal part, then we go to um, a less formal where I discuss the year and, and uh, after that take some questions. I have some questions here um, from one of our shareholders and uh, that I'll try to answer and then I'll open up to other questions. And then after that we're going to have two presentations, one by uh, Richard Carlton from the Canadian Securities Exchange, one of our standout investments, and then later from John Willick, one of our soon-to-be standout investments. And uh, so that's sort of how we'll do it. So we'll commence with the formal part, which is indeed formal. I always love to say, I always say that the meeting has to come to order, as if you're all having a party here and yelling and screaming, but please come to order. Um, I'm chairman I'm, uh, of the meeting, and I'm going to share it. So I'm president and CEO of Urbana. Welcome, everyone. We have our current directors with us, and I'd ask our directors to just stand so people can identify you and chase you later. Uh, so uh, introduce I was going to do it individually. That's Beth Colley. Um, yes. George Elliott, Michael Gundy, uh, Charlie Pennock, our Chief uh, Financial Officer, Sylvia Stinson. Uh, she's at the back near the door. Um, uh, Harry Liu, who's in-house legal counsel. Uh, and Brendan Caldwell, who's um, CEO of Caldwell Investment Management, the group and team that oversee Urbana's investment activities. Um, so I'm going to preside as chair, and I'm asked uh, Humza Yaqueb and Lori Grinton, uh, representatives of uh, TSX Trust. Uh, they are the registrar transfer agents of the corporations to act as scrutineers. Uh, and then the secretary has confirmed that the meeting materials were mailed to shareholders in accordance with all applicable laws on April the 28th, 2023. And I direct a copy of the declaration of mailing be attached to the schedule of minutes of this meeting. Uh, Prior to the meeting, uh, the, the scrutiny reported on the common shareholders present and the number of proxies received for the common shares, and I'd ask the secretary of the meeting to read that report, please. I have read the scrutineer's report on attendance, which states that there are a total of 30 common shareholders pre present in person or represented by proxy, holding 6,473,000 common shares. This meets the quorum requirements of the corporation for the purposes of this meeting. Thank you, Harry. Um, So I declare that with notice having been properly given the requisite quorum of shareholders being present, this meeting is properly constituted for the transaction of business. For each of the resolutions that follow, only the shareholders of common shares are invited to vote. All votes at this meeting will be taken by a show of hands, and I can report that prior to the meeting, sufficient proxies were voted in favor of each of the matters to be voted on in this meeting. Therefore, each of the items at the meeting will be approved. Uh, automatically. What, do we have an approval of the 6.4 million percentage? Do we have a percentage of approval of, of the 6.4? Um, it's, it's around 99%. 99%. Um, so the first item agenda is the approval of the minutes of the shareholders meeting held on June the 15th. Uh, 2022. These meetings are these minutes are available for inspection by the shareholders. Uh, unless there's an objection, I do not propose to have the minutes read, and I will entertain a motion to approve the minutes. I move that the minutes of the shareholders meeting held on June 15, 2022, be approved. Thank you. Uh, so I have a seconder for the motion, please. Uh, Mr. Gundy, uh, all in favor, signifies by raising your right hand. Contrary, if any. Okay. Financial statements. The next item of business is to place before the meeting the financial statements of the corporation for the year end of December 31st, 2022. These financial statements, together with the report of auditor, 
um, of the auditor dated March 22nd, 2023 have been duly available um, to all shareholders of the corporation. Are there any questions on the report or the financial statements? Now the next item of business is the election of directors. We don't need an approval of the financial statements. Right, okay. uh, is the election of directors. I declare the meeting open for nomination for the election of directors for the ensuing year or until their successors are elected or appointed. Um, could I have some nominations, please? Nominate Thomas S. Caldwell, Beth Colley, George Elliott, Michael Gundy, and Charles Pennock, individually and not as a slate for election as directors of the corporation. Thank you. Any further nominations? I declare the nominations closed and I have a motion to elect the directors of the corporation. Uh, that each of the persons who have been nominated be elected director of the corporation for the ensuing year or until his or her successor is elected or appointed. Thank you. Could I have a seconder, please? Mr. Pennock, thank you very much. All in favor? Contrary, if any? Carried. I declare each of those nominated have been elected as um, a director of the corporation for the ensuing year or until his or her successor is appointed. The next item of business is the appointment of auditor for the current year. May I now have a, a motion to appoint Deloitte LLP as the auditor of Urbana. I move that Deloitte LLP be hereby appointed auditor of the corporation to hold office until the close of the next annual meeting of shareholders or until its successor is appointed at such remuneration as may be fixed by the directors and the directors are authorized to fix such remuneration. Thank you. Could I have a seconder for that motion, please? Beth Colley, all in favor? Carried. Um, I'm going to speak about the corporation's operation after the formal part, as I said earlier, and will address some questions that have been received from shareholders. At this point, is there any further business to be brought before this meeting? I move that the meeting be terminated. Uh, right. <laughs> Thank you very much. Second, please. George Elliott, all in favor? Carried. Um, I have there Mr. Caldwell leaves the podium. Do I leave for some reason? Okay. Is this, is this a coup of some kind? <laughs> Do I miss something? Okay, get off. don't fall. We still need you. <laughs> um, this concludes the formal part of the meeting. In a moment, Mr. Caldwell is going to speak about the corporation's operations. Before we proceed, I'd like to draw your attention uh, to this legal disclaimer about forward-looking statements. Um, the following presentation may contain certain forward-looking statements within the meaning of the Ontario Securities Act and comparable legislation in other provinces. These forward-looking statements may involve known or unknown risks, uncertainties, and other factors which may cause the actual results or events to differ materially from those expressed, implied, or anticipated in such forward-looking statements. Unless required by applicable securities law, Urbana does not assume any obligation to update these forward-looking statements. There we go. Mr. Caldwell, please. That, of course, is in keeping with regulations that state that no one is responsible for anything. Um, let me look back a little bit on the year. 2022 had all kinds of challenges. You know, we had inflation, we had increasing interest rates, we had economic concerns about a recession that didn't quite happen. Uh, we had the war in Ukraine, we had uh, disruptions in European energy supplies and, and, and threats in Taiwan, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, interestingly enough, at the end of the year, uh, or part of it, the, the sector suffering the most damage was the high, sec high tech sector. And many of these very, very hot, lofty valuations have a tendency to fall back to earth. Uh, growth companies eventually become value companies. Uh, equity markets showed tremendous resilience, however, 
during the year to the shocks and concerns that people had because there was massive amounts of money and there still is on the sidelines looking for profitable homes. Urbana's net asset per share grew at 8.4% during the year and that eclipsed the Dow Jones Industrial Average in Canadian dollars, which was effectively flat for the year. And uh, the uh, S&P TMX Composite Index was down about 5.8%. So um, relatively, it was a very good performance year. Uh, we, we were happy with positive returns anytime we get it, but we obviously like more than that. Uh, as you know, our portfolio valuation as of year end, our, our net asset value per share has grown at about 14.6% annually compounded since October 2002. Um, and again, there's nothing that's close to that. Uh, our, our public investment portfolio focused a lot on U.S. financials and energy, and that really served us well through a good chunk of last year. The energy sector, we did really well. Uh, our thinking wasn't really deep. It was one of the things I've noticed is when, uh, when governments decide to cut supply of something, then the demand stays the same, the price goes up. And that's exactly what happened in the energy sector. We drove prices up. Um, the the uh, Financial sector, the U.S. finance, the big U.S., the, the, the Morgan Stanley's, the Citibanks, those type of things, and exchanges in the U.S., like the intercontinental exchanges, uh, all fared reasonably well, although they tend to drift lower. Fear of recession, people worry about banks, bad loans, real estate, etc. But uh, that notwithstanding, we ended up with a relatively positive year. Uh, the price for our common shares uh, grew at 13.7% last year. The, air sh the A shares were up 12.1%. Uh, if we look into this year, and this is our report of the year end, we anticipate a, a slowing of inflation. That's, that's, that seems to be what's happening. A topping out of interest rate increases, and we're still seeing some interest rate increases from the central banks, U.S. and Canada, but they're, they're sputtering a little bit now. We're, we're near the top of the range, at least on the near-term basis. I always find it very strange that on one hand, you have the central banks trying to clamp the system down with higher interest rates. On the other hand, you have governments spending money uh, to make sure nobody suffers any pain. So it's like your foot on the brake and the gas at the same time, which means you're not going to control inflation. And remember, inflation is a permanent fact of life. Just the, the number varies. It, it was never 2% when they said it was 2%, and it's always going to be the case. And the only way you can protect value, shareholder or investor value, is owning stuff. And equities are a very neat and convenient way of owning stuff. Uh, we look into the year, America is going to be spending significant funds, and this is our year in common, shortening supply lines, building infrastructures, and microchip capacity, expanding electrification, and clearly defense spending is going to be a big, big item because this, this war in Ukraine, it's like a test case. Everybody's finding what works, what doesn't work, and going back to the drawing boards and how to conduct a battle, and nobody's really figured that out yet. So essentially, the pressure for inflation is going to continue. Interest rates probably staying pretty well where they are, maybe up a little bit, maybe another 25 basis points, but I think we're where they want to be right now. Inflation numbers coming out of the U.S. seem to be easing off. Canada is a different kettle of fish because we are really dependent on the U.S. and frankly devoid of policies for Canada. So we're sort of uh, riding the crest or the peaks and troughs of waves as in the United States. Uh, in our private equity sector, several of our companies have, had, have been experiencing growth uh, we go sort of look forward to a maturation of some of these companies. Um, typically, we've tried to uh, maintain a, uh, how can I say, uh, a 50-50 a, a balance, about 50% private equity, 50% public equity. It gives us liquidity to make decisions. But the private equity, we have permanent capital, which is a great advantage, but sometimes a disadvantage. But we don't have to worry about redemptions. If the market goes quiet and doesn't do it, we still have the money to work with. Mind you, if we lose money on a trade, we've got to trade our way out of it and make it back again. But that gives us the opportunity to do private investing of, of different varieties. And, and that area has worked out extremely well for us over the, over the, over the last year or so. The, uh, this year, coming into it, we think is going to be fairly positive. But before we get to that, I'll just finish the last year. And also, uh, in, in 2022, we increased our dividend to 11%, that's a 10% increase over the previous year. We're trying to 
move it up a little bit each year. That's the fourth consecutive year we've increased our dividend. We also purchased and canceled about 1.6 million A shares under what's called a normal course issue or bid. And historically, we bought about 46 million over the years, over many years, of the A's, returning about $122 million to shareholders. Um, getting into the first quarter of this year, uh, we, we uh, that is end of March, we're up 1.7%. Uh, and it's been a tough year because the sectors that we focus on in the public area are the ones that have sort of suffered a little bit. That really doesn't concern me for a nanosecond. I'm very comfortable with the positions we have uh, going forward. The interesting part of the first quarter of this year, remember I mentioned the high techs got slaughtered last year? Well, that's the one that's been running. You know, the, everything from, from uh, Netflix to whatever, Amazon, all the, the big high, and the, the market is moving in that very narrow sector as opposed to anything else around. The rest of it is just sitting there, lying there, and dying there. But my sense is eventually this high tech sector will, how can I say, not fall back to earth, but after a while, the interest will broaden out into the broader market because the rest of the market has just been flat. So I, we're going to stay with the existing positions, and uh, we feel comfortable with the, the strategy, U.S. financials, big U.S. financials, and, and because as these local banks like Silicon Valley then you get, you know, get into trouble, the money comes still to the bigger ones. Canadian banks, we don't own any yet, but you know, that's an attractive area. They've come off about 20% from their highs, very good dividend yields, and dividends, by the way, to us are tax-free, so we like dividends. So that's the, where we see in the public sector. We're going to stay primarily in our existing uh, positions. The private sector has been checking along fairly well, and we've done quite well in that area. Uh, interesting companies like Integrated Grain Producers, IGPC, we're up about 400% in that position. Now, part of it is they're distributing money out of the company. It's a cash cow, and the money's being distributed as a capital distribution. So they're driving our costs down, um, uh, you know, so that, and our costs get lower and lower. In fact, I think our cost now is about $1.64, which isn't a real cost, but we're getting money back to reduce that cost. Uh, we would rather have dividends because capital gains we do get taxed on. Uh, and, and actually, it's up more than that. My valuation as of yesterday was $8.30. It's now $9 uh, today. Um, the ETF business, Evolve, uh, is, is one of the uh, exchange-traded funds, uh, manufacturers that we have an investment in. Uh, and that's been a very solid investment for us. We're up about 349%. Uh, and I'm not talking last year. That's, you know, from, from when we came in uh, to out. So we've had some very, very good wins in there. And one of them, this is why we keep writing, inviting Richard back with Canadian Securities Exchange, uh, has been a wonderful private investment for us. Uh, and that's up about 890% from our cost base. So we've had some really good wins. We got a couple of clangers in there too. I'd like, I wouldn't like to say, you know, we, we win at everything we do. The key is you want to win it more than you lose. And, and there's a couple there that, that can be problematic. Uh, I'm not going to give you the names of them because that would be bad advertising for them. But, but there's a couple there that we'll be just as happy when we do um, find ourselves liquidating. And we may find some liquidations coming this year as well because when I mentioned that 50-50 ratio, we're about 60-40 now. So I'd like to get a little bit more liquidity. And uh, so, that, so if we can reduce some of our private equity going forward, that's in fact um, what we'll do. So that's sort of a, a summary of where we are and where we've uh, been and where I think we're going to go. Uh, now I'm going to deal with some questions that have been sent to me. And after I finish these, um, if there's any other questions from the floor, I'll try to answer them as well. So anyway, one of the questions is, do we have a limited uh, tenure for directors on the board? The answer is no. If not, are we considering doing so within the next year? And the answer is no. Um, let me give you some background to that, just as, a, as opposed to an arbitrary no. There's an old phrase that soldiers, when they've been in combat for any length of time, they don't die easily and they don't die foolishly. There is nothing more important in managing money, in my opinion, than experience because you've seen stuff before, it's better at quelling your emotions. So in that regard, we, it takes a while to really get a director tuned in and really working in a company. And we have a pretty good team. So basically taking the examples of uh, Jimmy Pattison and Warren Buffett and Hazel McClellan, God bless her, uh, we're gonna stay with the directors we have. And, and I, the policy is, uh, uh, what do we replace? Well, if you become incompetent or dead, we will replace you. 
Um, but that's the policy as unwritten policy as existed. Da, da, da. Uh, would you publish a total return of share ex taking buybacks out of it? Uh, that is, we bought lots of shares. Is that impacting performance? That's a very, very difficult number to count. It, a, a shareholder did this some years ago for it. And we found the contribution of having bought back stocks was de minimis. It was under 1%. Because, and, the, and, the, and it's, it's very difficult. We bought what, what that number does is flawed because it assumes that money you bought it back with, you were not going to do anything with. That number is taken out of it, and that's wrong. There is a distinct body of thought that the buybacks, and, and I personally think they're a mistake looking back on it, the buybacks, we kind of felt we could close the gap between asset value and share price. Didn't do, it, didn't do anything, didn't change it 10 cents. But what it did is it made the company smaller. What is going to make this company more recognized is size, because a $350 million company is still a, mic a micro cap. This company has to get to a billion dollars before people are paying attention to it. The other thing is, too, uh, on buybacks, as they say, where it may have, may have, so actually I think it hurt the price. The other thing is, it assumes you didn't do anything with it. For example, I just mentioned a couple of numbers, even in the public thing, like white cap were up 171%, you know, over a year or so. Uh, and uh, those other numbers in the public things. Bank of America up 178, 445% CBOE, Intercontinental Exchange 284, uh, Morgan Stanley up 321%. My point is, if we hadn't bought the stock back, making a little, you know, you get a good discount, maybe we would have owned more of that stuff and had a greater rate of return. So it, it's, 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 a, it's a flawed number, but if somebody wants to calculate it and show it to me, I'd be uh, certainly look at it. Um, would a majority shareholder consider striking an independent committee to evaluate options of reducing the discount? We have exhausted every single option in that regard. Um, I don't think there's any company that's worked harder at that. And I think the gap is narrowed with size, not anything else. As I said, we bought tons of stock back. But we've, we've done a, a pretty robust job of marketing this company. And, and uh, Liz Namosky, who many of you know, has actually been in charge of that. And Liz, I think, is probably one of the best marketing people in this country, bar none, period. Uh, and I, I think, uh, I asked Liz just before the meeting, I love dropping people in the soup. I said, why don't you come out and just tell us a few of the things we've done to try to work on recognition of Urbana's uh, share. So why don't you come out and just tell us what you've done on the marketing side. Thank you. I don't want to take your glory, Thank you, Tom, okay. and good morning, everyone. Okay. So, Urbana Corporation Marketing and Communications. This month, well, June, June 2023, we had an article in Wealth Professional. Uh, we had Mr. Caldwell on BNN Bloomberg talking about exchanges and talking about Urbana. Uh, we also had a news forum appearance where the headline was, what do Ur uh, Urbana Corporation, Blue Ocean Technologies, and Robinhood all have in common? And that was last month. And they talked about Blue Ocean and Urbana and, and Robinhood. Uh, we've had large posters in the financial district in the path, which we keep moving because the traffic, the foot traffic moves all on a regular basis. So we've had that going on for a while. The insights videos, and these insights videos were created during COVID lockdown. The reason why they were created was because this was an unprecedented time for everyone all over the world. And we wanted to make sure that our shareholders, our clients, people who know us knew that we were there for them. And we wanted to be able to talk to them about the markets and let them feel a little bit of ease and comfort knowing that we are there and we're still working every day and helping them out uh, with their investments. Uh, October 2023, we actually held our very first inaugural uh, Investor Day. We had 12 powerful CEOs speaking at Investor Day, and they were all of our private equity investments. Uh, we created individual videos of each speaker and created a separate tab on the Urbana website with really cool dramatic music. So if you haven't heard the music, go onto the website and go to Investor Day and listen and watch. Um, we also created a LinkedIn page so that people can follow us. So follow Urbana Corporation on LinkedIn. We had a digital campaign with the Globe and Mail. We had 4 million views, believe it or not, 4 million views. 
of your Urbana logo. And that actually had thousands of people go to our website, which was really good. Um, we've also had full page ads in the Globe and Mail, the Financial Post with the tagline, ever thought of investing in private equity leading edge corporations? Now you can with Urbana Corporation. And the ad is featured, uh, it's featuring all of our leading edge private equity investments, and it's still full page on our website on the home page. Urbana was also a sponsor of the Empire Club of Canada Annual Investment Outlook 2023 when Mr. Caldwell was one of the speakers. Uh, we do our monthly mass email to shareholders and investors, and it used to be bi-monthly, but we've changed it to monthly now, and our press releases. You know, we don't just send out press releases when Urbana is in the news. We send out press releases to highlight our private equity investments as well. So we try to get the word out as much as possible. And that's all I've got. Yes? Can we get a microphone? I know you weren't anticipating questions, but <laughs> because the investor day was just so informative, do we have for this group, do we have the next one scheduled? Is there another one coming up or it's to be announced? Uh, it, right now it is to be announced. Okay. But attend. When it is announced, <laughs> make sure you attend because it is a pretty incredible day. Any other questions for me? Great. Thank you so much. Dun, 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 dun. So anyway, what are we doing to close the gap? I don't think striking a committee is going to do much more than that. I don't think there's anybody even close to that campaign. But again, it comes down to broker following. Remember, the brokers in Canada are mainly the bank-controlled firms who will only follow large cap corporations. Three fifth, 350 million is, is considered a micro cap. So we have to struggle and make noise and shoot off guns and everything to get people's attention. But we've spent a lot of time uh, doing this. Um, da, da, da. Transparency of, uh, do we have any clear vision of our transparency of investment? I, I, don't, I don't know of any company that's spent more time at that. Uh, we do spend a lot of time, a mix of public and private. We tend to go for, um, we don't go for the shiny objects that go by. Technology, technology comes and goes and fads, etc. We're interested in applied technology, companies that can benefit uh, to, to benefit from modern technology. And I think that's really one of the key things um, going forward. So applied technology, basic industries, we tend to stay with big caps. I'm talking about the public side. We tend to stay with big caps. Typically, and where you can create value in big caps is buy them when nobody wants them. Buy them during periods of crises, i.e. we buy the energy stocks when everybody thinks we're all going to be plugging our cars in, which we may well, but the, the overreaction was too much, and we made very good money for our shareholders on that basis. The, the, um, the, the board is the management that compensating, reducing non-donating shares. I don't know what the, this has good. Has the board considered tying management compensation uh, to reducing, no, we're not going to change the, co the, the company works, it works well, everybody in the company works well, we're not going to change how we do stuff. We might increase our director's fees because they work very hard at it, a lot harder than your traditional director does because they get called up into the line, uh, as Charlie does very often and, and all of our other directors to help out in mergers we're doing. That's not the traditional role of directors, so they're doing a lot more than the average. Um, there's a question here about the Canadian Securities Exchange, and I, I'm going to just answer it superficially because of uh, uh, Richard's going to give his chat. The Canadian Securities Exchange has finally been given approval to list big companies, exchange-traded funds, etc. And that approval has been long coming. Uh, I'm, I'm not saying I'm not going to criticize regulators or anything because I know the price of doing that, um, but. It's taken a long time to get that approval, and it's now in place. And, and uh, so we can now go head-to-head -head with the Toronto Stock Exchange. And that is going to open all kinds of possibilities for us and for others. Now, there are any other questions from the floor? Yes, sir. 
I see on page nine, I just wanted to ask you about the, uh, the foray into mining. Are you planning to uh, actually produce or you're holding on to the property, hoping that there might be uh, a buyer might be interested in your, in your property because of its, uh, of its reserves? It's not actually, I don't mean to correct, but it's not a foray into mine. Urbana was originally a, 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 an exploration company. It was called Urban, Urban Quebec Mines, which is a bit of a misnomer because they didn't have a mine. But, but, you know, they were very positive. And when I took the company over, I expanded that gold property. There were only six claims. We expanded them to 74 claims uh, in Urban Township, which was like, at the back of beyond, nobody was looking. In fact, you had to fly in, fly out. It was not a lot. It was very expensive work. Uh, we did some exploration on that property. Uh, it is um, on, on the surface, or close to surface, it is quite erratic. That is, you can find mass, very rich grades here. Ten feet away, nothing. And, and uh, that makes it very difficult because gold has to come from some ways. It percolates up from the magma. And gold, gold uh, mines tend to be like pencils. They plunge. They're very little on the surface, but they go down and they bend and twist type of thing. And that means deep drilling, really expensive. Um, so we did some work on it. We improved the, the geological knowledge of the property. And then it became a very hot area. Urban, urban towns, urban and Barry, which is the township underneath us, became mineral exploration hotspots in the world. So um, Osisco, it was immediately adjacent on our northern boundary. They have spent, if not a billion dollars, it's darn close to it, or it may even be over it. They spent a billion, they drilled everything in sight. That thing looks like cheese cake, you know, or Swiss cheese. Underneath us is Bonterra, and they've taken up, they, they, they have finally accumulated, so there's these, these two big blocks, both of them extremely well funded. And so what I thought I would do Running an exploration company properly is a big job. You know, to, to get one guy into the bush with a chainsaw is going to take you two weeks. You know, and he's going to cut his foot off or anything. So, you know, you're, it's, it's just a scene. So from my perspective, it's a lot easier for us to buy and sell securities or look at, look at corporate deals uh, and private deals. So it made sense to us to, we have a lot of work we've done on the property so we can hold it. We're just going to hold it. We're like playing poker. We're going to see who has the mine, because one of them has to come to us. Because the, the, the gold formations in Urban Township run virtually north-south right through our property. So if Osisco wants to follow that vein that they're following, one, one hole was, I don't know, a couple hundred feet from our boundary. So they're going to have to come south, or Bonterra will go north. Or somebody might come in if they find it's a real mining camp. osisco has got some mines on its property. I don't think they're big barn burners. They're, they're, they're passable, they're probably profitable, but they're deep and they're expensive and their aura is all over the place. So we're just going to sit back and play poker for the time being. Uh, we might, from time to time, spend a couple hundred thousand dollars just to uh, see if we can do it, but uh, we don't want to be in the mining business. I'd love to sell it to somebody, give us some stock or cash, and give us a royalty if you have a mine. And that's really, I see it as an investment holding just like a stock or whatever else. Any other questions? Yes, ma'am. Uh, wait, wait, please, the microphone. Thank you. Thank you. I recently had a conversation with someone who may or may not be an intern with you this year, and his question was, why invest in Urbana? Well, um, the, the asset value is about, uh, hang on, I'll give you the exact, $7.50. The stock is trading at uh, um, $3.80. So it's about half price of what the assets are really worth. Uh, I believe those assets are significantly understated. Those assets have been growing at just under 15% over the last 20 years. You're not going to find anything that's better than that staring at you. I like to think the management group is fairly competent as well. So. Next question. There was another one over here someplace. Based on your uh, comments, should we assume that uh, you're not planning on any share buybacks in the foreseeable future then? Well, as I mentioned, <clears throat> I don't think it's helped. I think we have to, I mean, I have a goal in life to build Urbana's assets to $1 billion before I drop dead, which means I've got to be really smart or live till I'm 115 years of age. But 
that's really where the game plan is going to be, to, to move it from there. And a couple of big winners along the way will probably help. I'm not precluding buybacks. I always get approvals every year to do buybacks. But right now, I'd like to build liquidity. For example, if we have a big sale of one of our, one of our assets in the private equity, um, then we might buy some more stock back. But I want to build liquidity. I want to get back to the 50-50 balance and have liquidity. The beauty with public companies and liquidity is I can make a decision. I was talking to a, a company out of Asia that takes a long time uh, to make a decision. And I, we had this at a dinner. And I said, well, if I want to buy your company, um, you know, they said it was going to be two months. I said, if I want to buy your company and I like it and I have the money, I can buy it right now at dinner. You know, I, that's how fast we can make a decision if we want to do that. So I, I want to build liquidity. I'm not precluding it. I'm always going to have approvals in case a big block comes or an event. We have to be a little bit careful in Urbana and buybacks now because Urbana is an insider of itself. We have a couple of deals up that may or may not happen. Um, but if they happen and they're big paydays and we bought back a bunch of stock just prior to that, all of these board members and myself are going up to the OSC to explain <laughs> why we bought it back. So it, it's, it's, it's really interesting. You're always worried about tipping over, but we're going to have approvals. I'm not making any, and I've never made any commitment to buy stock back, but you know, if it makes sense, I got some extra cash, might do it, but uh, I, I'm not going to say no or yes. I'm sorry that's not a, a sort of a fuzzy answer, but the answer is a crisp, I don't know. <laughs> so that, that's about it. The private equity, by the way, just part of investment policy. We look at companies that are innovative, doing something different. That's why we looked at CSC. That's why we look at Blue Ocean. These are really, really neat companies doing something different. And, and uh, because a lot of, uh, and, and sometimes we go to startups or near startups, which is quite risky. But um, our style is to get somebody that's doing something different than what is out there. Somebody out of the box type of thing. If there's no other questions, then I'm getting, starting to bore, oh yeah, yes. Tom. Can you turn? I don't have. I, I, can you hear me now? Yes, I can. Thank you. Okay. First, I completely agree with not buying shares back because my age. I've seen a couple companies that bought their shares back and spent increasing their dividend. I'm not saying this is going to happen to Urban or any company, but then the company went belly up, yep. bankrupt. At least the ones that got dividend got something, but the ones that got bought back to shares, and in a lot of cases, not in this case, they bought them at a higher price. And then finally they lost everything. So I have experienced that myself, so. Well, I, I definitely agree with dividends all the way. Well, we, we've tried to do that for the share price as well. We've introduced a dividend, um, and, and then uh, we've been increasing the dividend. So we'll come up on radar screens for investors who are, what companies are increasing dividends. So we're doing the do things, and dividends are very important. Plus, I own a lot of stock, and I like the dividends myself. All right. Second, second question is, just out of curiosity, the unreleased, unrealized gain or investments in 2022 and 2021, as in 2021, this is on page uh, six, I believe, uh, there was a gain of 61 million in 2022, 19 million. Mm -hmm. uh, where did the, what happened in 2021 to make that huge gain? Well, I, 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 let me see. What page is this? Six? Yeah, I believe. Yeah. I would think a good chunk of that was in, in the private area. I don't know, uh, Sylvia, whether you'd be able to shed some light on that, but a lot of this is unrealized too. So yeah, it's marked to market. Um, so it, it isn't money that we have that we can actually spend. But uh, Sylvia, do you have any brilliant thoughts? I, I can't see it right now on the thing. Yeah, um, we're going back to 2021, so that was a while ago. Um, for some reason, I'm thinking it might have to do with the CSE. Um, I think that might. Have I think been that was the. I chunk. think that was the the big winner. If I'm going, I'm going to these statements. Uh, I think it was the CSE. That's why we keep inviting Richard back. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, the, the, the U.S. financials also had a good move during that period of time. 
But you are quite right on these buybacks. One of the things I'm continually told by shareholders, yeah, they like the buybacks, but people want to be part of owning a company that's growing, not of a company that's getting smaller. And that's what buybacks are doing. They're saying, oh, we don't think we can grow this company. We have to grow this company to get profile, to get notice, and that would be more than anything to close the gap. I've gone on long enough. And any other burning questions, you can ask me after, so I'm going to be around for a bit, uh, God willing. The, um, first off, the CSE. It's been a great investment, great people, great management. And uh, Richard kindly, we've really kind of worn him out a bit, but uh, we're going to have him back and just give a little bit, and then we're going to do Blue Ocean, which is very, very exciting. Not that you're not exciting, Richard. <laughs> Okay, well, again, it's a pleasure to be back, uh, uh, and thank you to the Urbana team for the opportunity to uh, speak to the shareholder group again this year. Uh, it has, in fact, been a number of years in a row, and uh, uh, I do begin every year by, again, expressing the thanks from the employees and the management and the board of the Canadian Securities Exchange for the support that Urbana and their management team have provided to us over the years. Um, we were literally at death's door in 2011 and 2012 when we began talking to the Urbana team and it was the leap of faith that they made, the risk appetite that they had and the relationships that we had formed over many years that uh, led them to give us not much, a bit of a hand, and, uh, but we knew we had faith that with that support we'd be able to make a real difference in the Canadian public equity markets. And so we'll uh, talk a little bit today about the progress that we've been making over the last, uh, the last couple of years. And of course, anticipating that uh, you know, the, all the SIBO news last week, they had this big global exchange announcement that they were doing, and there was going to be uh, a flag here and in the United States and Europe and Asia Pacific. So I was anticipating some questions about that. And then, of course, our friends at the TMX group released a white paper this morning uh, on uh, uh, capital formation, in particular with a view to promoting, supporting the uh, junior capital markets, which uh, apparently is going to include the creation of yet another exchange uh, by our friends at the TMX group to basically focus on exactly what we are doing. Uh, so I'll be able to talk a little bit about that in the context of uh, uh, some of the information that I have here today. But really, I just want to give you a state of where the business is right now. And so, obviously, retail trading, which is extremely important to both Urbana, but also to pretty much all of the issuers on the Canadian Securities Exchange. And then the really neat story that we have this year, which is you've heard a lot about critical minerals, shortening supply chains, electrification of the economy. Well, I can tell you it's happening on the Canadian Securities Exchange. We are playing a leading role in the provision of capital to the companies that are making all of these things happen. So, the headlines. Retail investor activity is obviously way down. And uh, I've got an interesting plot, and in I think on the next or maybe one after, showing retail trading activity on the CSC basically collapsing as soon as interest rates went up and the cost of living, uh, the CPI, CPI increase on a monthly basis also began to increase. We're actually trading at levels we haven't seen since 2017. So that's a, a challenge. But the listings business is very strong. And again, primarily supported by the mining industry. And of course, the challenge with the miners, unlike our friends in cannabis and high tech and so on, there's not a lot of pizzazz around these stocks until they begin to report the results, which is often a year or two after they actually list. So we're in the phase right now where they have just listed, they've raised their funds, many of them are tramping around the bush, the, the guy with the chainsaw that we hope he doesn't cut his foot off is going around the bush right now. We're not going to see the news from this summer's activity until later in the fall. And we hope that that is obviously a spur for more investor interest in the space. Tom mentioned that our new listings policies, which both raise the bar for all of the companies listed on the CSE, as well as giving us a senior tier, a senior board, the big board, whatever you want to call it, 
Uh, we actually ran a contest at the office and we hated all of the responses, so we don't really have a name for it yet. But we're able to not so much declare outright war on the Toronto Stock Exchange. Um, I did work there for 12 years after all at one point in my career. But the point here is that we have a number of companies who have already grown up to global scale with multiple billion dollar market cap. And we have to be able to regulate these companies on the same basis as if they were on the Toronto Stock Exchange, New York, or NASDAQ, London, whatever. So we actually have that in place. We got another treat from the regulators. This one took even longer. So back in 2003, when the organization was launching, we spoke to the folks at what is now CIRO, the Canadian Investment Regulatory Organization, about providing for margin eligibility for stocks that list on the CSE. We have an email from them in 2004 saying, hold your horses, we're looking at the overall policy, we know that it doesn't make sense, we'll look after you. Last Friday, 19 years after that email from the regulator, we got notice that CIRO has in fact recognized the CSC as an exchange of which the stocks are now eligible for margin relief. Now, this is really technical inside baseball stuff because really all it means technically is that when Mr. Caldwell is holding securities in inventory for whatever purpose, whether managing an offering or as an offset to some other position that they're doing over the counter of whatever, a derivative strategy, it means that they get a discount on the regulatory capital they would otherwise have to hold against those stocks that are in inventory. It's a long-winded way of saying it gets a heck of a lot cheaper for people to do financings for Canadian securities exchange companies. It gives dealers the option to provide margin loans to clients so that people can trade stocks on margin, again, if they decide that that's the case. It also means that stocks will be eligible for single stock options classes if they are big enough and liquid enough, and we have about 10 or 15. And I'll be speaking with the folks at the Canadian Derivatives Clearing Corporation this week to uh, have that one and, and watch them shift uncomfortably in their chairs and try to figure out how to say no, but they can't. Uh, so this is going to be fun, which will have obviously a tremendously positive impact in the liquidity uh, of those names. Now, most of them are U.S. cannabis issuers. A couple of them are some of our more successful and more advanced mining projects. As you can see from some of the branding, we've got new color scheme, slightly modified logo from the one that Mr. Caldwell designed in the Air Canada Lounge in Calgary one morning as we were on a national road show. Uh, it is derivative and evolutionary of, of course, the work that Mr. Caldwell did. Uh, and uh, in, in part and parcel of that, we have a new website coming, which will be considerably more feature-rich, faster to load, and a whole bunch of other good things. And we'll be seeing that later this summer. We're obviously dealing with the impact of crypto winter. Last year, I believe I spoke about our interest in listing tokenized securities and providing a competitive clearing and settlement capability for those instruments so that we could reduce the cost and impact of managing uh, these, these so-called corporate actions associated or affiliated with these instruments. Well, Mr. Bankman-Fried and his uh, colleagues have basically killed any, any appetite for risk on the part of the regulators in Canada and the United States. We were going to need some help if we were going to get that project up and running. So with that and some of the other issues that we're working on, we figure we're just going to park that one for a bit. It's still a good idea, and we didn't spend a lot of money on it, but as I say, this is something that is basically we're going to have a, have a wait and see on that uh, for, for, for a bit. Now, I mentioned SIBO Global. Um, obviously, the Chicago Board Options Exchange uh, purchased uh, our colleagues at uh, NEO a year and a half or so ago at uh, an incredible multiple. And uh, they are now trying to figure out how to make all of their cash equity businesses around the world work together and try to provide a competitive alternative to issuers in Canada, the United States, Australia, Japan, and Europe uh, to the existing exchanges that uh, are currently in place. Now, I'll let you in on a little secret. SIBO is a tremendous exchange operator. They have fantastic technology. Their order types are really innovative and they're really smart in terms of their capability of, of, of bringing market makers and more liquidity into the market. 
they know absolutely nothing about listing companies. They have no reputation or capability with um, the regulators, the issuer community, the investment dealers, the bankers, the lawyers, the accountants in the processes, procedures that you need to follow, that you have to have in place, and the experienced team to be able to work with these companies and bring them onto the market. So again, focusing on what we do best, which is service the issuers with expertise, with caring, with constructive ability to help solve their problems, is going to continue to see us winning the majority of the battles when we go head to head not just with SIBO, but with whatever the TMX group is going to throw at us in the next uh, couple of years. I'm really confident about that. So, what has that resulted in? Well, I stole this slide, I will admit freely in this uh, public forum, from the Australian Stock Exchange. They recently published a strategic uh, uh, direction, a plan for the next five years. This was provided publicly at their Investor Day uh, a week ago Friday, I believe, in Sydney. And one of the slides they were talking about was our strength in, in listings and how they stack up against the uh, names around the world. Now, the top name in their slide was TSX. Okay, so, and everybody are down there, so Australia, they're saying, hey, we're right up there with the Toronto Stock Exchange, we're ahead of the Japanese, we're NASDAQ, London Stock Exchange, Hong Kong, and uh, the New York Stock Exchange. And actually, in their slide, they had the one new issue that their cousins in New Zealand had, had listed. I thought that was a little mean, actually. Um, but they <laughs> acknowledged the one stock that the uh, New Zealand Stock Exchange had, had listed last year. So I said, well, wouldn't it be fun to put our name up there? Well, guess what? We led the world. Fastest growing exchange in the world, which is kind of cool. Uh, but it does speak volumes to both the fact that Canadian investors have an appetite for early stage companies and are prepared to take on that risk profile and that we have the capability, the team, the systems, and the support, obviously from our shareholders, from our board, to deliver you know, what is clearly an industry-leading solution for these companies. Did the TSX listing have the company Those were, in fact, we haven't engineered out the SPACs and the exchange-traded products, so that was, that was all issuers, uh, Brendan. So yeah, and obviously the vast majority of ours, in fact, the entirety of ours, we're companies, real, live, entrepreneur-led people that are investing money in projects, creating jobs, and ultimately wealth for the Canadian economy. Same thing on NASDAQ. I believe about half of theirs were SPACs. Some percentage was uh, SPACs on the uh, New York Stock Exchange. And uh, uh, so, so, yeah, I mean, again, we didn't play any silly bugger games with, uh, with the numbers. This is it. On an absolute number, we, uh, we, still, we still come out way ahead. I mentioned uh, plotting our trading activity, which is basically 97% retail, uh, against uh, increases in the CPI and the overnight rate. And you can see, and uh, you know, the gentleman had the question about 2021 and, and why there was a, a big uh, bump in unrealized gains. Uh, yes, Urbana did uh, increase the valuation that they carried the Canadian Securities Exchange. And you can see the tip of that, uh, that bar chart there is in fact 2021. Uh, so we were extremely profitable uh, in terms of the free cash that we were generating at that point. And uh, as you can see, as soon as the uh, inflation specter appeared, and then in particular, when the overnight rate began to uh, increase, we saw the significant decline in overall retail trading activity. Now, as I say, that said, we have also got the listings business, which is driving probably 45 to 48% of the bus. We also have the market data business, uh, which is accounting for close to a third of the revenues that uh, we're generating. So again, we have hedges against this sort of seasonality or, or, or changes in overall trading patterns uh, in, our, in our bottom line. Yes, Charlie? Richard, have you any sense of what that compared to TSX and Venture? Almost identical for the Venture. Uh, a little less pronounced on the TSX because, again, institutional activity uh, is, is more constant. Uh, it's, it's not as uh, um, volatile or variable as, uh, as retail trading activity. Now, I talked a little bit about the mining space. 
So this is, uh, these are the new mining companies that we have uh, listed over the last uh, uh, three and a half years at this point. And uh, as you can see, uh, we listed last year almost 80 companies, but the trend line is, is absolutely clear here. And as I mentioned, um, this year, uh, we will, by the end of the year, this is, I think, the end of April, um, we will have far exceeded last year's number of mining companies that come in. I'm guessing that we'll see probably 100 to 105 new mining companies join the exchange. The uh, blue line is conditional approval. The green line is applications that are currently under review. So we haven't even seen the companies yet that will be listing in sort of the October, November, December timeframe, which is traditionally a very strong period for, for mining finance. Uh, one other small fact that, uh, again, validates the model, validates the service proposition that, uh, that we are offering the marketplace. 22 new mining exploration companies listed in Canada in the first quarter of 2023. We listed all of them. So if you want to know why the Toronto Stock Exchange, the TMX group, is talking about setting up a new exchange, issuing white papers, and consultation with the industry and all of that stuff, that's why. They've noticed. We are absolutely eating their lunch on the new listings business of real companies. Uh, this is, of course, numbers that you can't possibly see from where you are sitting. Uh, but what it basically demonstrates is two things. One, Mining has always been an important part of the capital that is raised by companies uh, listed on the exchange. Uh, the second thing is, as you can see, mining is now taking the leading role in the capital formation that's happening on the exchange. Again, you know, we kind of look back fondly to the days when the cannabis companies were raising billions of dollars out of March, uh, which is great. I love those days. But uh, the, uh, the mining industry is solid. The actual number of transactions that are being completed is, are comparable across the board. Uh, it's just that the average exploration stage mining company, when they are looking to send the guy with the chainsaw into the woods, typically needs 10 to $12 million to do that. And so the, the financing deals are relatively small, and, uh, uh, but there are lots and lots of them, uh, which is, uh, which is uh, extremely positive for us. And, I'm happy to take any questions, and if not, relinquish the floor to my friend and colleague, John Willick. Ah, sorry. Let me ask one question. Yes, here he comes. Thank you. Uh, one question. You mentioned data. Are we adequately compensated for the data that is the information we provided by the regulators? That was a, uh, a that was a that was a plant uh, that was a plant from the uh, audience. Uh, uh, so the short answer is, if you were if you were a fly on the wall of the strategic planning session that we're having with our board uh, in a in a week or so, uh, you will hear me explain a couple of things. We're using this lull in the uh, uh, retail trading activity and uh, downturn in revenues that we're generating from the trading function. To, base, to build the base for the next you know, rush that we know is coming sooner or later. We don't know when it's going to happen, but it will come. And so there's a variety of things that we're doing. We're making some investments in our infrastructure to increase the capacity when the time comes. We're doing a number of other things on the marketing side. We're spending some more money now that COVID's over to get out, see people. And again, we're gratified by the response that we're seeing on the, on the listing side. We have not been able to address or make any material changes to our, in fact, any changes to our data fees since 2016. And in 2016, we were less than, considerably less than half the size and half the relevance to the Canadian market that we are now. The data policies of our regulators in Canada are an absolute mess, and this isn't anything that I haven't said to them privately or publicly, so I'm, I'm, I'm okay on this. But what they've done is they have supported the continued monopoly in the provision of data products through the TMX group exchanges. They have prevented effective competition on trading and capital formation. Because if you're, again, retail investors, sophisticated family office investors, issuers, folks that are you know, really market savvy, 
they don't understand what's going on because most of the time when they go onto their computer, their site or whatever, they're only getting data from one source and that's from the Toronto Stock Exchange or the Venture Exchange. And so they're not seeing what's happening on us, they're not seeing what's happening on NASDAQ Canada, on SIBO Canada, on Omega or any one of the other uh, venues that, that's out there. And of course, if I'm a CEO of a company and I'm seeing 50% of my trading volume is happening somewhere that I can't see, I'm assuming that somebody's doing me wrong. And they're probably not, but they call it, you know, dark pools, dark trading, it's all just... So, so the policies do two things. One, they inhibit our ability to compete because, again, it's hard for people to get access to our data. I mean, we've done all of the things. We, we worked with Bloomberg and Refinitiv and the big data vendors and you actually can see the data on places like Google Finance Portal and Yahoo Finance and a bunch of other places that cater to a retail audience in particular. But the real key is on the investment advisor desks across Canada. And it doesn't matter whether you're at Royal Bank or whether you're at Canaccord or whatever. Most people have decided for cost reasons to restrict the data that they see to TMX products. And that is a real problem uh, when our issuers are talking to their investment bankers that are pitching the, uh, their, their companies and, and the participation of the investment advisor's clients in a capital raise or to, to in a secondary market way, if that advisor can't see the data, they're gonna, it's going to take a real effort to get them to purchase that story. So, to make a long story short, Tom, yes, we are focusing on the market data fees. We have come up with some ways where we think we can capture more value from that undertaking without having to force the regulators to completely change the policy framework that they've created. There is a process reviewing that policy framework underway, but um, let's put it this way, Urbana will be a billion dollar corporation before that process finds its way through to any practical uh, result for, for us. So we're going to have to take care of ourselves and do some things uh, a little bit out of the box in order to capture that value and to increase access to the data, but we're on it. So in that instance, is CBOE a, an ally or an adversary in there? Would they be supportive of that type of regulatory change? Uh, they're absolutely an ally, um, as is NASDAQ and Omega and the other uh, non-TMX exchanges. Uh, I suppose I shouldn't admit this uh, publicly, but yeah, we've been known to meet on occasion. Uh, not in a, you know, anything that's anti-competitive or anything, mind you, but uh, uh, we do have common concerns. And yes, the industry, um, other than the other guys across the street here, uh, are of a single mind in terms of what the right approach is moving forward. All major banks meet from time to time also. <laughs> Um, when you talk about the senior listing, uh, when is that operational? When will Evolve be listed on the CSE? Uh, if I had to go out on a limb, you'd see a press release next week uh, that will line up the... Uh, so, so it will happen in phases. Uh, uh, a little birdie tells me that Urbana will be one of the first companies that is added to the senior board. <laughs> Great to hear. Um, you had talked in previous um, AGMs on uh, the clearing initiative, and that's changed over time. Uh, last time it was going to be more of a short-term uh, short proposition, splits, beneficial owners, share count. Just where, where is that overall initiative at? Well, as I said, for us to launch clearing and settlement for uh, tokenized securities was going to require a big leap of faith from our regulators. They are not prepared to make that leap of faith at this point with the FTX collapse and the SEC going after Binance, uh, uh, Coinbase, and uh, the rest of the so-called uh, crypto exchanges and clearing uh, organizations in the United States. Not happening. So there was no, there was never going to be any clearing of, of equities? No, 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 no. Okay. What I'm saying is we had positive signals two years ago that uh, willingness to work with us and provide the exemptions needed evaporated the moment that Sam Bankman-Fried was taken out in chains from his uh, uh, penthouse condo in the Bahamas. Oh no, I, okay, so just for clarification, it, it was always about crypto clearing. It wasn't gonna be about No, security. not crypto. Okay, tokenization. Tokenized securities. Okay. Um, and then lastly, where, where are you looking to deploy capital? So what are, what are your top 
three spots in terms of deploying that capital? Well, as I mentioned, the, um, in fact, we, we hosted the CEO of Arista yesterday uh, because uh, she noticed that we're spending a lot of money on uh, switches, which is basically the key thing to our back-end communications network. And really, that's all about anticipating the next big boom in trading. So again, we're using this lull to enhance the infrastructure that we have in place to ensure that uh, we can continue to provide uh, very high levels of performance uh, on the uh, trading side. Uh, second, our staff complement has increased by our standards materially uh, to provide more services to both the larger issuer population that we have and the greater regulatory obligations that we are undertaking. So those are the two uh, key areas of investment. All right. Thank you very much again. I always said at the CSC, Richard said it in a more detailed way, but we have a secret weapon at the Canadian Securities Exchange vis-a-vis -vis our competitors, our main competitor, and that is we are nice to our customers. That sounds pedantic, but I'll tell you, that makes all the difference. We help people to raise money and work them through the process. We don't see them as adversarial or fly-by-night or anything else. Our competitor has done that over the years, hence zero listings when we get a whole bunch of them. We, we know the exchange space, or used to know it, and still know it reasonably well. Richard mentioned CBOE, the Chicago Board Option Exchange. We were the largest donor of the Chicago Board Option Exchange prior to their demutualization, as we were a lot of other exchanges. So we still have about a $20 million investment in that company, um, and it's, it's been a very well-run company and trading systems. But going into the listings business, as you said, that's new territory for them, and I don't know that they have the, the team to achieve what they want to achieve. In terms of innovation, I was saying we look for companies who are doing something. Then Blue Ocean is really neat. We came into this early on, not the earliest, but we came in a little later. And essentially it was to allow people in Asia to trade American securities during their daylight hours instead of overnight. Uh, and there, so somebody can trade daylight over there. Institutions could always do it, but not the retail guy particularly. That was the genesis of the idea. But we also discovered that, uh, that while we were building that out, uh, that American companies were trading American securities in their overnight. So we become the go-to um, after-hours trading venue that has been growing very, very dramatically in the last little while. And uh, people are standing up and taking note. One of our uh, traders was at a trading event a few days ago, and the whole topic of conversation uh, that evening was Blue Ocean. It's been written up in the Wall Street Journal, uh, with a deal with Robin Hood. Uh, this is going to be, a, or this we believe is a very interesting investment. John Willick is in charge of strategy, and uh, he's kindly come, and he's going to tell us about Blue Ocean even more. Thanks, John. Thanks very much. So I guess to expand initially, what is Blue Ocean and, and uh, some of the U.S. market structure to give a better understanding of what exactly we represent. So uh, much like Canada, there's multiple trading venues. There's several listing venues. You have NASDAQ, you have NYSE, for example, that list a bunch of stocks. That's under the, what's called the Regulation National Market System, Reg NMS. And there's a bunch of secondary markets called ATSs, Alternative Trading Systems, which compete for trading in those same securities. Uh, there's about 33 of those at this point in time. Some of them trade only during the core hours of the trading day, so 9.30 to 4 p.m. Uh, some of the stock exchanges own multiple ATSs, and they do that for the reasons of, for example, different pricing structure that suits certain audience types, or uh, having things like uh, dark markets, so if you wanted to trade blocks, you're able to do that sort of thing. Some of them also trade from 4 a.m. until the market open, uh, and that's called the pre-trade session. Some trade between 4 p.m. and 8 p.m. called the post-trade session, but none of them thus far 
far until Blue Ocean came around, traded during what's called the overnight session, uh, or as we call it, the Blue Ocean session, which is 8 p.m. to 4 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. Uh, and we follow, by the way, the NYSE calendar as far as market holidays, things of that sort. So we're open exactly the same sorts of trading days you'd expect to see any other U.S. equities venue, with the exception of the fact that this means that because we're trading the overnight session, uh, an interesting anecdote is we become the first venue that opens the market week for U.S. equities, 8 p.m. Sunday night, which is a extremely important point to consider when you look at what's been happening in the news recently. So when you have uh, U.S. debt ceiling discussions over a weekend, you have a U.S. bank collapse issue in California that might negotiate something into a Monday morning outcome or might come out with Sunday news, we're the first venue where you can actually make something out of that information. You can come to the marketplace, place your trades, uh, adjust your, your parameters as you see fit in, tr in terms of trading on a marketplace, uh, and that, is, that has become an incredibly compelling point. And we're going to continue to emphasize that uh, as we continue to expand and to grow. But to Tom's point, uh, which was about Asian markets, um, I want to, uh, to just get to the important slide here, which is why did we start in this market? Why are these hours important? We're talking about one third of a 24 hour cycle that previously was completely unserved. That alone, an eight hour session is something that's very attractive to even consider being the only player in because you have complete opportunity to take whatever is there. You're not competing to take order flow away from somebody else. Uh, and generally when you fill a gap, there is going to be something that is 100% upside for us to take. And in that respect, uh, this is the Valaparis circle, a great uh, 8,000 kilometer uh, radius, uh, sorry, 8,000 kilometer diameter, not radius, uh, circle across Asia that has over 4 billion people, over 50% of the world's population sits within this and from a time zone perspective, more or less aligns with the trading hours that we've been open. This is also over 50% of worldwide wealth, uh, and obviously one of the growing uh, areas in terms of wealth concentration, as well as population, uh, as time goes on and demographic trends continue as they have thus far. And for us, that was an extremely compelling reason to go and begin to pursue opportunities to trade in those markets for those audiences, uh, South Korea being a leading example of somewhere that we've had uh, incredibly impactful uh, market access in, in recent months and announcements, uh, and to begin to grow our journey from that point and really cultivate some of the trading opportunities that we could see with the trading community there uh, and progressively expand into everywhere else around the world. And I would like to say that circle is where we started, but everything within this map is where we're going as far as uh, the total trading opportunity. Um, I will show in one of these slides, and, and there are uh, obviously other publications talking about the fact that Robinhood in the U.S., a well-known retail broker, uh, recently announced the availability of 24-hour trading in equities. The reason for that, and it's 24 by 5, I should say, not by 7, because we still do have a weekend gap. But that availability is because they make available Blue Ocean access overnight. So we are the reason uh, that you could place an order at 9 p.m., for example, with Robinhood because you see a crazy tweet from Elon and you feel inspired to react to that. And otherwise, markets might be closed, but something like a high-value, uh, high-liquidity instrument like Tesla is available to trade on a marketplace, whether you're retail and you have that fundamental desire for whatever reason to make a trade and to act on that information, or you're a professional who sees any other reason to act, to rebalance your portfolio, consider market volatility, risk, and opportunity, uh, and to take action. Um, I'd also like to point out there's some really interesting opportunities that start opening up when you go and you look at the 24-hour clock and you say, what is trading, for example, the 14 major Japanese corporations who have U.S. cross listings? We are the only available venue, as I said, that's crossing over with their trading hours where you can trade the core Japanese equity during their daytime, as well as through our venue, the U.S. underlying equity. And so when you do things like that, you create various opportunities for other types of inspiration for trading strategies. So people who are looking at arbitrage trading between the foreign exchange component against those two equities, for example, creating reasons for new trading, new liquidity to be created uh, around markets. And so just to, to emphasize a couple of points here I'd like to bring uh, from what I just said, the market, the world, is fully 24 hours. Nobody is, uh, is, is going to deny that things like what Richard mentioned with the crypto markets being 24 hours, but foreign exchange markets in terms of uh, legitimate markets or, or regulated markets, even a lot of futures are generally available most of the trading hours uh, of a 24-hour of a clock uh, during weekdays. And so why should equities not also be available? And especially when you consider that the U.S. markets are arguably the world's most liquid, most well-recognized, most uh, globally traded as far as access and distribution and recognition 
recognition, uh, as well as a substantial amount of major corporate uh, international listings that cross-list in the U.S. as well. Not to say they don't do that in Canada, CSE or TMX, but the U.S. certainly has a lot of those as well. So this, this has essentially been a very compelling value proposition, not just for those uh, who've invested, such as Urbana, but also for the trading community that we have aimed to serve, uh, again, having started very significantly from an Asian market perspective, but growing globally uh, from that perspective to other markets through Robinhood, for example, US included, uh, which has resulted in about uh, what I'll call 10x growth over the last number of months since January. I joined the company as head of strategy in January. Uh, we were doing about a million shares a day, and that was a pretty decent day uh, for our trading sessions. Over the course of May, we hit an all-time high of 30 million, but we're doing uh, an average of, call it 12 or so million a day, uh, which is a pretty decent number when you consider that uh, we're not a very large staff. Uh, it's a very lean company. We're, we're essentially mainly technologists with a number of business people attached. Uh, and we're able to do this by creating funnels. And funnels is really where we are able to create marginal revenue from relatively limited fixed costs. You have banks and brokers who are our only types of clients, FINRA registered dealers. They go out and they acquire whomever those secondary clients are, whether they're Asia-based uh, retail online brokers, other proprietary trading firms, or buy side firms, and they can do that across the globe. They solicit that business, they take that order flow, they bring it to us and they execute with Blue Ocean, and we have to deal with that more limited audience of clients from a trading perspective, and we can concentrate our efforts on expanding and leveraging those relationships to reach much, much broader audiences that would be necessary for us to do directly. And the same can be said from a data perspective. We do have integrations with a number of worldwide data vendors, Refinitiv being probably the best known. We are not on Bloomberg at this point, for example, which is something we're working on as we continue to grow. And data is a very important part of our strategy. And as, as far as our revenue is concerned, certainly something we see uh, dividends coming from as time goes on. And before I get into some of these points, I'd just like to say it's actually very hard to do something like trade overnight. And that, that was something that was very unique for us to have built. In theory, anyone could put up their trading engine for those particular hours, but you begin to bump up against things that are very, uh, very old legacy items that have been hard-coded for decades. For example, uh, is the clearing system open overnight? It is not. Are other uh, market data facilities that you would need to report to, for example, open overnight? They are also not. Historically, uh, are the brokers able to process things like corporate actions immediately at 8 p.m. when, let's just say, the previous day's session would arguably have closed for an immediate restart for the next day's trading session at 8 p.m. the way the calendar works? The answer, again, is, uh, is not, not possible, generally speaking, for a lot of those banks and brokers. So the, the couple of years that we've invested in building this out has been not just a matter of gaining all of those clients, but it's also a matter of building all that intelligence, that resilience, that business process to essentially insert ourselves into something that was not there and was not possible to do before, uh, and which is still in some cases uh, you know, an ongoing process to improve how we do things in order to accommodate the legacy, but also to talk to the legacy and bring it forward. So talking to DTCC, for example, about how information about trades can be delivered to them on a more timely basis to be settled uh, in an overnight session versus the next morning, which would be the case today. Um, so most importantly, though, I just want to highlight some of the numbers we have uh, on the right side of the screen. So we're still small. Call it daytime trading volumes in the U.S. are about 10 billion overnight volumes, or I should say not overnight, but outside of hours for the pre-market and the post-market are 700 million thereabouts on a daily basis. We're only talking at this point about making uh, about 30 odd million at a peak, which is still very, very small. We have a lot of room to grow, but this is already massive growth from where we were even six months ago, let alone further back than that. Otherwise, I would argue uh, a lot of what you would expect to see from any exchange or professional ATS operator during daytime hours is what we have available as well. It's a fully, fully lit order book model, as is the CSE, NASDAQ, TMX, whomever of your choice. Uh, this is fully transparent information. You know exactly what you're going to get if you're going to place an order. And the order types are relatively straightforward. We don't have complications uh, that would suit let's say certain types of uh, multi-market daytime trading markets. And we also have very straightforward fee uh, basis, which is industry standard and uh, relatively attractive uh, for those participants who care about that part of things, but leave us actually a relatively more premium fee at this point than would be the case if we were to compare ourselves to daytime trading pricing. So again, just to summarize, from a, a globe perspective, 
as you can see, concentration on the uh, Asia Pacific Rim uh, as far as the types of firms and the names that we have as new clientele. And this is over the course of 2023, January to date. Uh, Robinhood being the big one that we can disclose on the U.S. side. I will say this is by no means all-encompassing. This is just who we have permission to disclose participation from. There is a long list of additional firms who, uh, who maintain confidentiality at this point, such as industry practice for some of them. Um, and there's a lot more that are on the cusp that I'd love to announce, but we may have to wait a little bit longer for some of that information to come through uh, in order for us to disclose. Um, and what we have essentially, and, and this, this summarizes it quite well, is an indirect relationship from a trading perspective. Some U.S. FINRA registered broker dealer brings us the order flow from some of these Asia-based clients, for example, but we have a direct monetization relationship from a market data perspective. So we are maintaining direct relationships with these firms. We are deeply involved in conversation with them about how they display us, how they talk about us to their audience, how they make us available for trading, uh, and what value proposition they portray of us in that respect. Uh, and we're obviously collecting revenue from this as well, which uh, as a ATS operator is relatively unique. Uh, for the most part, ATSs have historically tended to give their data away either for free or at such a rate that it would essentially be a rounding error. We can charge in our two business lines as far as revenue are concerned our transaction fees where we have some rebates, we have some net capture, uh, and then also the market data side, which principally is uh, recurring revenue, generally on a 12-month contract. Uh, it's relatively easy to administer. It's relatively high margin. There's relatively low fixed cost in maintaining that once you have it in place. Uh, it is actually something that we think is, is going to be a you know, substantial driver uh, of, of ongoing income security for the company as we continue to grow the volume side uh, and is, uh, is just getting started. The, the pipeline for both sides, both volume and, uh, and data is, uh, is substantial and, uh, and looking very attractive at this point. So to summarize a couple of points here, first of all, just in the corner, uh, an example of how trading hours overlap uh, between various major markets, just to put this in perspective as far as who's open, when and where on a 24-hour calendar basis, uh, as well as where we think things are going uh, with respect to our future. So we're trading overnight. That's great. That's just the start of a 24-hour clock. Why couldn't we potentially work our way all the way up to having a, a slice of every one of those hours that the day contains? Uh, the question I would say earliest would be whether we look to do the pre-market session first or the post-market session. Lots of pros and cons I could address as to why one or the other would be the first thing to go towards. Uh, and progressively, and I would say the highest lift, the most expense, uh, ultimately to a certain extent, uh, you know, the, the greatest potential reward just given the size of the market would be the daytime trading hours. Uh, that can be done as an ATS. At some point, we can look towards possibly becoming an exchange registration, which again has a, a lot of implications from a regulatory and cost perspective, uh, definitely has some value opportunities, which I'm happy to discuss in more detail for those who care for those things. Uh, but, but all of this essentially leaves an incredible amount of value uh, when you consider how much is available from a total clock of volume available, as well as a market data revenue perspective as we continue to grow this, again, from the uh, initial audience that we have to, let's say, even uh, Indian markets, which in the last 24 months have become much more open for trading uh, in terms of uh, purchasing of foreign shares than they were historically. The uh, Central Bank of India has, uh, has issued uh, certain uh, regulations around that in the last 24 months, and that's been you know, another logical uh, next leap market for us to look at and talk to, and a billion people who very often are working during overlapping hours uh, with the market hours that we currently have um, and have been looking for ways to expand their market access and not have to do that during the overnight for their local time zones, for example. So things of that nature that we're looking forward to, which are very exciting for us. Um, and, uh, and I would say probably the most important that I can share right now that we're looking at is uh, how do we increase our visibility in our mind share? And, and some of that starts from a very fundamental perspective. Richard talked about being visible on things like Yahoo Finance. Currently, we are not. If you go there and you look for a standard Apple or a Tesla quote, uh, anything after hours, either it's unavailable or it's sporadically available depending on the platform you're looking at, there's certainly nothing available from 8 p.m. to 4 a.m. Making that known, making it known to whether it's the U.S. public or any other global public that there is even an ability to trade during these hours uh, is something that we're keenly focused on. So marketing in that respect, availability of real-time post-trade data on a website of that, of that sort, a finance website, 
delayed for that matter. All of these things, uh, I would say, are, are big efforts over the next six months for the rest of this year uh, to help it make it known that, uh, that this is an opportunity, trading can be done during these hours, and that we'd welcome uh, any and all from whichever market to, uh, to come to us and, and connect. Uh, and of course, our broker partners, as I mentioned, will be doing a lot of that marketing for us as well, since they are trying to solicit volumes and, uh, and bring as much of that as they can to us during the hours that we're available. Um, I would say if anything happens as far as the interest rate changes, things of that note, note that uh, Richard mentioned as well, volatility is our friend, relatively speaking. Um, anything that is event driven uh, generally will cause a spike. Uh, the day that we had, for example, the highest volume was the uh, first Monday session, if I'm not mistaken, uh, after the SVB uh, issues were taking place in the US. So just this rush of repricing, of uh, assessment of risk, whether it was retail or reactionary uh, or more informed than that, um, lots of opportunity for those sorts of things, just given the state of affairs, I would say, economically uh, for the rest of 2023 to play out for us as well. I'd be happy to take any questions with that. Please, let's start over here. Thank you, John. How far ahead would you say that you are in terms of um, competitors coming up behind you and offering 24-hour access? Uh, well, we've got probably 24 months of experience ahead of them. Uh, there, is, there is nothing to say that it's not possible for a, you know, a global major exchange, whether it be CBOE, for example, since Richard focused on them, NASDAQ, NYSE, uh, to, to come forward and make an investment and make a decision to get into that space. I'd argue that um, it is unlikely uh, and, and much less palatable than you would think to make that investment, both from an operations perspective, uh, from a lot of the issues that we've had to solve and iron out perspective as well. It isn't worthwhile for them to extend themselves necessarily into those hours. If they were to make an investment of that sort, it would probably behoove them instead to, uh, to purchase the competitor who is already established in that respect, which would make us, if anything, uh, you know, an attractive target for them to talk to. Um, but it would probably take anywhere from 12 to 24 months to really get something like that meaningfully going. Um, I would say long-term basis, 100% it will take place, uh, but we have a great head start ahead of that. Next question? Please go ahead. You mentioned your presence in South Korea and Japan. Are there any other yeah. countries in which you are establishing your presence or hope to? Sure. So we, we actually do have staff in South Korea. Companies head offices, uh, Palm Beach Gardens, Florida. I'm based here in Toronto for anyone who'd like to have further discussions. But um, we, we, have, uh, we have made a big inroad into specifically South Korea and Japan initially uh, in terms of Asian markets. We're sort of working our way southbound from there into Singapore, for example, Malaysia, Australia, uh, places like that that align with the time zone. And I'd argue that we'd probably follow the sun from there going westwards across India into Europe. Uh, and of course, not to ignore our North American backyard here as well. Is, is there a particular moat that you would point to that does, other than that 12 to 24 month ramp up? That a moat? moat? Yeah, I, I would say, uh, frankly, two operational moats. The, the ability to secure this business in terms of building those relationships, uh, directing that order flow to our venue has been an incredible effort. It is, it is no small feat to get either a market maker onboarded or to get that retail order flow. Um, and retail order flow tends to be sticky, is very attractive, uh, and is the most expensive and difficult to get. And that's actually what we have the highest concentration of at this point. Um, and that's something that we have been able to attract and retain. And I see that as being something that's slow and, uh, and difficult to move for anyone looking to attract it away from us. And if there is any competition that comes in, we have the ability to observe what they're doing, to plan accordingly, whether that's price change, technology change, any other model change, uh, to get ahead of that narrative um, and to, you know, to essentially ensure that we, we are maintaining our market share. And, and where do you see the breakdown between data and trading? So right now we're, we're probably 48-52 in terms of that revenue split. Um, I would say that that will be much more heavily dependent on the amount of volume that both macro and company specific factors will cause as to exactly what that revenue breakdown looks like in the, in the future. Data on a long term basis is what all of the, the exchange groups have in the last 20 years particularly been able to grow and focus on. Uh, fee compression, I'm sure, is not something that we're seeing now, but could be something that we see in the future uh, on the trading fee side of things. 
Um, but at this point, uh, it, you know, it's, a, it's about 50-50. It could end up being 60-40 at some point, let's say, in a, in a foreseeable period of time. Uh, beyond that, it's, it's more difficult to forecast, especially as we grow, right? If we, if we start joining different market hours, dynamics change significantly as well. Further questions? All right. Thank you. Well, thank you, John. And, and uh, I think we've given about fulsome information if we can. I'm sorry we've run a little bit longer than our usual time, but uh, some of us will be here for a little while afterwards if you want to ask any questions. But thank you for coming. Have a good year. Hopefully we'll see you next year. <laughs>